Hello everyone. Quite a while ago, I reviewed and then improved the smallest welding inverter from AliExpress. You can find the link to the video in the description. Apparently, such videos are in demand, so the topic will be continued. And today we will look at a compact, handheld induction heater from the same online platform. Heaters of this kind are quite popular nowadays, very relevant for people who do bodywork. Such a heater will help to unscrew bolts, easily remove paint from the body, and so on. They are also relevant for knife makers and people involved in metalworking, forging, hardening, and so on. The induction method is based on heating ferromagnetic materials with eddy currents, and it is much more efficient compared to classical heating methods. This is because this type of heater heats the metal directly, but Let's return to our heater. I'll say right away, this is not a cheap pleasure it costs from $180 to $200, but that's with express delivery included. I received it in just a week by courier. For those interested, I'll leave a link to this specific heater in the description. Regarding the cost, a similar unit from well-known manufacturers would cost much more. Comes in a beautiful case that looks very expensive. The dimensions of the case are now in front of you. The case has locks, the frame is aluminum, and the covering is plastic. Overall, it's made quite well. It so happened that part of this video is being filmed six months after receiving the device, so the device itself is already used. And that's for the best, since I've been using it for quite a while and can talk about all the advantages and disadvantages that have been noticed. Inside the case is the heater itself, which I thought would be smaller. Next, we see a bunch of inductors in the manual. There are seven inductors. The wire diameter is two and a half millimeters, and there is heat resistant insulation. The set also includes two pieces of wire with insulation. If necessary, you can wind an inductor of the desired shape yourself. Moreover, if you have wire with the necessary insulation on hand, you can wind as many inductors as you like. The heater weighs 1.1 kilograms. The stated power is one kilowatt. The device is powered by a wide range of voltages from 110 to 240 volts. The manual is very helpful. Everything the user needs to know is included. For example, the device should not be operated continuously for more than two minutes. The inductor may overheat since it lacks water cooling. If the insulation of the inductor winding is damaged, an interturn short circuit or a short circuit through the workpiece may occur. Nothing serious will happen, but it's better not to tempt fate. The manual also includes information on the heating time for bolts of a certain caliber to 300 degrees Celsius, how to properly position the workpiece in the inductor, and so on. In general, there are a lot of nuances. For those interested, I will leave a scan of the manual in the description. You can download it and study it in more detail. Before we start testing and understanding what it is capable of, let's first disassemble the device for a surface examination of the internals. The device is disassembled by unscrewing nine self-tapping screws. Inside, everything is quite serious. All the electronics, including the control system and power unit, are located on a relatively small printed circuit board. A power transformer is installed nearby, with its secondary winding loaded by an inductor. We have a small 12-volt fan. It's fairly quiet, but unfortunately, if the heater itself is operating at high power, the airflow is insufficient. Additionally, the fan sucks in warm air that forms around the inductor and then circulates it throughout the casing, expelling it at the back, which is a very poor solution. On the board, there is a decent power line filter and a fuse. Next, the mains voltage is rectified by a bridge. The bridge here is powerful KBU 250 25 amp with a reverse voltage of 1000 volts. There are two power transistors here in A2247 package. And note, these are not just any components, but Infineon switches. And Infineons are expensive, and here the manufacturer didn't skimp. These are quite powerful IGBT transistors rated at 1600 volts and with a current of up to 40 amps. Considering the claimed power of 1000 watts, they have a good margin. Under the heatsink, there's a choke on a ferrite core. Regarding the control system, here things aren't all that rosy for one reason. The markings on all the chips are erased, 
and considering the complete lack of any schematics for it, if such a device suddenly breaks down, repairing it will be very difficult, or even practically impossible. Well, of course you can compare the pinout of the chips and the surrounding circuitry, but it's time-consuming, tedious, and requires serious knowledge in pulse technology. In general, even if you take it to a repair shop, the technician is likely not going to bother with it. For the erased markings, a big negative for the manufacturer. Given what's been said, you can only guess which chip is responsible for what. On this chip, a power supply is likely assembled to power the control system. Next, there should ideally be a PWM controller and another chip. There is probably a frequency auto-tuning system here, and this chip is involved in that unit. But that's not certain. Next comes the driver for controlling the IGBT switches. On the same board, we see a couple of capacitors that are used in the oscillating circuit. Not the best capacitors for this part of the circuit, but not the worst either. And then comes the power transformer. The core here is U-shaped, or maybe C-shaped, and it's quite large, with a clearly visible non-magnetic gap between the halves. This suggests that the heater circuit is single-ended. The secondary winding of the transformer is wound with Litz wire, and additionally insulated with Captain heat-resistant tape. The transformer lacks sidewalls on its frame. In this case, it's more of a plus, as all the windings will be well ventilated. The leads of the secondary winding are attached to two massive aluminum heat sinks, to which the inductor is, in turn, attached or rather pressed. This is actually quite important because the inductor does not have water cooling and will heat up significantly during operation, and the heat sinks help dissipate heat from the inductor. There is a front light based on a 5mm white LED, which is only active when the device is operating. On the positive side, all the wires here are in silicone heat-resistant insulation, and the board itself is coated with varnish. The transformer is wound with Litz wire to reduce the skin effect. The presence of massive heat sinks for cooling the inductor is also important. Almost all power components have a margin. There are no special criteria for the internals, except for the erased markings. It's also pleasing to see the presence of a thermal relay at 65 degrees. Tests. First, you need to install the inductor. This is done in a simple way. Loosen the fasteners, install the inductor, tighten the fasteners. I thought for a long time about how to measure the temperature of the workpieces to understand how hot this heater can get. Using a thermometer with a thermocouple isn't quite right here. The eddy currents will clearly cause interference, and the thermometer will show inaccurate values. So, I used a professional high precision infrared pyrometer. I know that these devices inaccurately show temperature on shiny surfaces and all that. But in our case, there won't be any shiny surfaces. Moreover, we don't need super high precision measurements. The heater is activated by pressing a single button. It doesn't lock in place. Once released, the device turns off. Important! Due to the lack of water cooling, the inductor gets very hot during operation. After turning off the system, it takes some time for the inductor to cool down to a safe temperature. Therefore, you shouldn't touch the inductor even after it's turned off. There's a risk of getting burned. Let's connect the device to the network through a wattmeter. The inductor is installed, the workpiece is absent, in other words, it's running idle. The consumption was about 260 watts, and will vary between 130 to 300 watts depending on the type of inductor installed. It's important to understand that the stated 1000 watts of power is achieved only under certain conditions. The larger the size of the workpiece, the more power the inductor will consume. The maximum I was able to record was 1400-1500 watts, but that's the input consumption. Considering the system's efficiency, I think this heater outputs its 1000 watts. I think it's clear that, for example, you can't heat aluminum with such an induction heater. But we will still conduct the experiment. The black electrical tape on the workpiece is necessary for an accurate temperature measurement. The metal, of course, heats up slightly, but that's the heat from the inductor. However, aluminum and other non-ferrous metals can not only be heated, but also melted with such a heater. However, for this, you will need a graphite crucible like this one. 
we throw pieces of aluminum inside and cover the crucible with something non-flammable. To retain heat, it's advisable to wrap the crucible, for example, with asbestos cloth. In my case, the crucible is wrapped with basalt fiber. Is such a device capable of heating iron to its melting point? I tried it, and on a fairly large piece of iron. The first time, it seemed like everything was working and the iron was starting to yield. But the inductor accidentally burned out, either due to a short circuit of the windings by the workpiece, or we actually managed to surpass the Curie point for iron and heat the workpiece to a temperature above 1085 degrees, and the heat from the workpiece melted the inductor. To understand if this was the case, I wound a more robust inductor, into which the workpiece would fit very snugly. But here too failure awaited. Initially, there were numerous short circuits between the workpiece and the inductor, and then the heater itself went into overheat protection. The third time, I quickly rewound the inductor, waited for the heater to cool down completely, and armed myself with a pyrometer. Unfortunately, the pyrometer indicates that we still haven't surpassed the Curie point. Directly, without thermal insulation, iron cannot be melted with such an inductor. The maximum you will get is 750 to 770 degrees Celsius. And finally, some tips and nuances. For effective heating, choose an inductor that is optimal for the diameter of the workpiece. The smaller the distance from the edges of the workpiece to the inductor coil, the higher the efficiency. But under no circumstances should the workpiece make contact with the inductor coils, especially if the insulation on the latter is damaged. To be fair, I must note that in practice, the inductor coils have accidentally made contact with the workpiece multiple times. As you can see, the heater was not damaged. Remember that inductors do not have forced water cooling, do not run continuously for more than two minutes. After every two minutes of operation, take a break for a few minutes. Do not turn on the heater when the inductor is empty without a workpiece. But even if you do this, nothing serious will happen. It will just lead to the self-heating of the inductor. As I mentioned, you can wind the inductors yourself. It is not advisable to use wires with a diameter of less than 2 mm for these purposes. It's better to use a pipe or a bus bar like these. If you set up water cooling, the heater can safely operate for a long time. The inductance of the complete inductors ranges from 0.3 to 0.6 microhenries. I tried different inductances and I would say the optimal is 0.607, although the device is not critical to the inductors due to the use of a decoupling transformer. This is a universal device for home use. You can easily make yourself a cup of coffee or fry an egg on it if you use an inductor of the appropriate form factor, as well as cookware for standard induction stoves. The problem is that, unlike an induction cooktop, there is no power adjustment here. But if you have nothing else on hand, you can make do with this thing. In just a few seconds, it can defrost a lock or iron pipes even in hard to reach places as you can use a flexible wire as an inductor, which is wound directly onto the pipe. The wire needs to be in heat-resistant insulation. Quickly removing paint by heating the surface is also not a problem. On the same Chinese marketplaces, you can come across very popular heaters with two transistors using the ZVS circuit. They also have decent power and are much cheaper. But the problem is that the latter are powered by low voltage in the range of 12 to 60 volts, 
and they also require a powerful power supply. Plus, they lack the protective components that this heater has. Moreover, it's simpler, cheaper, and faster to make a ZVS at home on the fly than to buy one. Whether you need such a heater or not, and whether it's worth buying at all, is up to you to decide. I'm not much help in this matter. I just reviewed another purchase from AliExpress in hopes of creating interesting content and nothing more. Rate this video, share it with friends, and if you have time, you can follow me on Instagram. That's all from me. As always, this was Kazyanov K. With you, and until next time, bye.